provide equity financing to innovative companies that could be based in France, of course, or anywhere in the world. We have investment in, in the US, in Israel, and even in Japan. We invest in digital companies, which would not be the topic of today, as well as in healthcare, including food, pharma, surgical solutions, and drugs. Oh, fantastic. So you get to see quite a bit of what's happening in healthcare. Well, we think we do. Uh, just to give you numbers, we receive about 900 proposals of investment in healthcare alone per year. Um, and of course, we are very selective in the companies that we will choose for investing in, and probably we'll invest in only 20 out of those 900 companies per year. So very, very selective. Which brings me on to my next question. What sorts of innovations are you seeing in the healthcare sector? The title of, the, of today was the healthcare problems and getting solution to healthcare problems. So what are the healthcare problems? Well, the first objective of healthcare is maintaining people healthy all over the world for cheaper costs in a context when the population is getting older. That is a big challenge. So innovation bringing economy, so reducing costs of providing the same cure and prevention is one point. Finding new treatment for uncured diseases would be another. And increasing the role of prevention to, to maintain people healthier longer and to prevent them to need expensive treatment costs is, of course, of major interest. And as an investor, um, I mean, we could talk generally about how do you find investment, but frankly, that would be a little bit dull. Um, but as an investor, what are the differences as a healthcare startup? What, what, what are the different, what are you looking for that's different specifically to healthcare versus, say, a general sort of technology investment? I think when you're managing a company, when you're an entrepreneur or a CEO, you have to think not only in the unique selling proposition of what your products or what your solution is providing to the market, but you also need to think in terms of what your company is offering to venture capital as a unique selling proposition, meaning making the marketing of your company as opposed to the marketing of your products or of your innovation. And those are two totally different concepts. So what makes you unique as a company to obtain a successful fundraising? It's probably the quality of the management and the quality of the products that you're going to develop, either your research innovation uh, companies or you do have sales. But uh, the promise that you're providing to the uh, venture capital community is that ultimately, either you're going to get sustainable revenues with gross margin and cash flow positive company at some point, or that you're, get, that you're gonna get acquired. That's the promise that you're selling. And then you, you have to give reinsurance that the probability of success is high enough for, make, for attracting venture capital. So all what I say is not different from, from a healthcare company to a normal um, revenue bearing company. However, there are some differentiations between the healthcare uh, entrepreneur that, are, that is raising funds and the digital, digital health or digital uh, consumer or digital whatever company that is raising funds. First, in the healthcare business, most of the company do not generate revenue before exit. Most of them are R&D companies that will spend money and then even get listed for some of them, and then get acquired. Why? Because generally the cost of market access in a healthcare field is just too big and not affordable for um, independent company. To give you some figures as well, just remember that um, any of the big pharma company, let's say Pfizer, for example, is spending about $25 million per day in R&D. So the amount that those big companies are spending 
will never ever compare with the um, spending that a small company could ever afford. So why are they partnering with small companies rather than inventing their own drugs and healthcare solutions alone? Because they find that the smaller company would be more creative and would be more agile in finding disruptive innovation and finding new solutions. And again, to give you figures, those big companies are, are if you look at the portfolio, let's zoom on drugs for a minute, but it would be the same if I was speaking about surgical solutions or diagnostics. If you look at their portfolio, between 30% and 50% of the, the drugs or their product are not invented internally and have been acquired or in licensed although they're spending 25 million a day, as, as I mentioned. So the job of a small company would be to have the venture capitalist understand and believe that the quality of the management and the quality of the intellectual property of this healthcare company would be enough to be acquired for big value by this kind of big pharma companies. And because there is no revenue, and because the importance of IP, intellectual property, is, a, is much bigger in a healthcare company than it would be in any other non-healthcare related business, it, it requires then that the venture capitalists have some kind of knowledge in medicine, in regulatory, and there is a hurdle in the sense that if a small company goes and see a, any venture capital without selecting which one is mo most suited to its own case, then it's very likely that the entrepreneur will have meetings, will spend the hours, but will get no money at the end of the process and will just have wasted his time. So there's quite a distinct difference in so much as when you're looking at traditional organizations, it's, it's the numbers and are you turning a profit? But actually, as a healthcare or related um, organization, it's the IP um, that's more likely to get you the investment because what the investor, the larger companies are looking for that IP and the research and development that's gone behind it and not so much around have you been able to turn a profit as yet? For most, um, for most startup and innovative company, yes, yes, that's the case. Their value of acquisition or their value of listing market capitalization will come from the entry barriers, meaning intellectual property behind it. But some of the healthcare companies are gen revenue generating. Little of them, but some of them are. And I know we spoke um, before this a little bit about the difference between sort of technology and pure healthcare sort of organizations when it comes to investment. Can you speak a little bit to that? So if you've got technology around healthcare that you're looking for an investment for versus say a new drug, how does that differ? When you look at innovation and how to fundraise, I could say that you have to understand yourself whether your unique selling proposition is that you're providing disruptive, tech, disruptive innovation or whether you're providing a new product in a structured or even matured market. If you're in the last category that you're providing a new product, say you're providing a new drug but on a known target, or if you are providing um, a new solution to a known disease and a known mechanism of action, it's a completely different journey uh, from the case when your company is providing disruptive technology. If you're providing disruptive technology, you probably have a proposition where it's higher reward, but it's also higher risk. And you would raise more capital before exit, so you have longer time to exit, higher capital spending before exit, higher risk profile, but you also bring a higher multiple in case of success. This category um, generally it attracts a lot of 
of a venture capital fund with large fundraisings, but have to be selected as to which type of venture capitalist can have deep pockets, which type of venture capitalist can follow the following rounds of um, capital fundraising. Because if you, if you make the wrong choice in the first place, then the journey will be more difficult. And so, so that's for the ones with disruptive, tech, disruptive healthcare solutions. What if you're um, making micro um, innovations within healthcare? Is it the same sort of process? Because presumably, if you're coming up with something new, there's a, there's a whole educational process that goes around that, not just you know, people don't understand what it is that you're looking to resolve. Yeah. To illustrate what you, what, these questions, I will take an example. I'll take probably what is the most disruptive innovation of this century, which is the knowledge of the gut microbiome. So it's known for a long time that there are bacteria in, in, in the gut of every human being as well as in any uh, animal. That has been known for a long time, even at the Roman or even in the antique period, it was known. However, it was only the, like a decade ago that the um, sequencing and bioinformatic um, type of um, segment were matured enough to be able to measure which bacteria we had in our body, in our gut. And then, the science has, has then designed mapping of those bacteria, and it was discovered that every one of us had different uh, composition of our gut, and that this, what is called now microbiome, so this collection of bacteria that we have in our gut, was related to our health, meaning if an individual had some type of bacteria, or in the contrary, if it was lacking some type of bacteria, then it would develop uh, pathologies such as, of course, things linked to the uh, gut, such as the inflammatory bowel disease, the Crohn disease, and a lot of immune disease, but also some diseases in the um, uh, brain, Alzheimer, Parkinson, autism, depression, and even cancer. This has been discovered very recently. This is totally disruptive, of course, because it changes the whole medical paradigm. All of those diseases are chronic diseases that currently are unknown to the medical community in the sense of the etiology of the pathology is unknown. Therefore, there is no treatment. And when you look backward, when you look at history, it is funny to see that over the last century, so over 100 years, the innovations that have been done in healthcare have resulted in 30 years life expectancy increased. So our life expectancy 100 years ago was 30 years less than what a baby has when he's born now. Why? Because a lot of inno innovations have been made in reducing infectious diseases mainly. And a lot of very serious infectious disease have been eradicated and reduced a lot. However, by reducing the infectious disease, we have changed the microbial uh, composition of our gut very much. Using a lot of antibiotics have decreased the diversity of the bacteria we have in our gut. And therefore, at the same time that we were decreasing infectious disease, we were increasing the immune system related diseases and the chronic diseases such as the one that I've mentioned, which have, which have increased a lot over the last uh, century. So we now have a healthcare problems, as the title of the meeting was, which is how can we solve those chronic diseases? When you're a startup that is working in the microbiome field, the first step you have to do when you go to venture capitalist is to explain educationally, what this microbiome innovation is about, how this new wave of innovation was completely revolutionized the way medicine is done, the role of food in prevention, 
and will completely disrupt the, the business part of the food industry, the diagnostic industry, and the pharma industry. So as, as, as just an ad anecdotal story, when, when my portfolio companies, entrepreneurs, we are, who are working in the microbiome, were raising funds, three years ago, when they had meetings with venture capitalists, the first hour was dedicated to explain what the microbiome was. And then the venture capitalist would ask, oh, and by the way, what is your company doing in that field? Three years after, there has been a lot of education in the field, and the meeting can start with asking the entrepreneur what he does. But that shows you how much educational component is needed in healthcare, when even the professional of this sector don't know what is happening in it. So therefore, if you're, you know, for those in the audience who might be looking for investment and they're, they're change makers with healthcare solutions that are disruptive, um, they're going to have to be prepared to have an educational component of any pitch that they're doing and expect that actually most of that initial pitching might just be educational. Yes, exactly. So the first step as an entrepreneur would be to define what is your unique selling proposition. If you are a pioneer in a disruptive uh, segment, then spend the time at the beginning of your meeting with, with venture capitalists to explain the market potential and the disruptive uh, aspect of your segment before you jump in explaining what the company is doing. And just as a final question, what would be your final thoughts to anybody who's here today, got the pleasure of listening to you from an investment perspective with some really radical or even, you know, micro changes within the healthcare segment that are looking to get some ideas out? What would be your biggest piece of advice that you could give them? I insisted during my talk on the fact that you have to know your company. And that is, and the reason why I insisted that much on that is that 95% of the company that come and knock at our door do not. Meaning they explain their products, their solution, their innovation, but they haven't spent enough time to think about the marketing of their own company. And it is not necessarily mandatory that your company is working in a disruptive field. Of course, it's better, but not everybody wakes up in the morning having a disruptive ideas. And not all startups or innovative companies are that disruptive. So even when you have just an idea of a new product that will bring some benefits to the medical community or to the business community, you can still raise funds and make a lot of money. And as an example, I'd mention a, a US-based company that is called Amarin. Amarin is today a listed company and with a market uh, capitalization of more than a billion. What does it do? It is using cod oil, Ville de Foie de Morue, cod oil that it, it has developed as a drug to, to um, address cardiovascular indication in prevention and, and secondary prevention. Well, I guess that cod oil was something that was used for a long time, and little kids 50 years ago used to eat cod oil, but they were not valued one billion. So it's not a disruptive innovation, it's just an illustration of people that had a good ideas, that thought that the market was proven, the mechanism of action was proven, and all they had to do is find a clever regulatory path for having this product reimbursed and regulated. And that was it. So thank you so much. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, can you please put your hands together?